Hi, my name's Alex Yanaku. I'm 27 years old and I'm from London. I'm an electronic engineering graduate and I'll be starting my master's degree in space engineering this October. This is my entry to the Royal Aeronautical Society's AeroTube 2021 competition. My chosen topic is NASA's Voyager missions. I chose this topic because as a child I saw the images the Voyager spacecraft took of the outer planets and even as a child I was amazed at the idea that humans had designed, built and launched a spacecraft that allowed us to explore the solar system. I hope you enjoy the video. We are explorers. Something about forging new paths into the great unknown is irresistibly tantalizing to the human soul. Maybe it's the possibility of discovering something previously unknown to mankind, or perhaps it's just the simple thrill of adventure. Even thousands of years ago, the ancient Greeks were exploring the world to the best of their ability. Alexander the Great expanded his empire from Macedonia through modern-day Egypt and the Middle East and reached as far as India. And in the 10th century, Leif Erikson set sail from Iceland with a team of Vikings to become the first Europeans to discover North America. It was therefore only a matter of technology catching up to our exploratory nature before we turned science fiction into reality and took the notion of exploration to a new extreme, outer space. And thanks to developments in aerospace engineering, primarily at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, this was finally made possible. In the summer of 1964, aeronautics grad student and part-time Jet Propulsion Lab aerospace engineer Gary Flandro discovered that a unique planetary alignment would occur in the late 1970s that only happens once every 175 years. This alignment would allow a single spacecraft to fly past all four of the outer planets by using the gravity of one to boost itself onto the next. This method of interplanetary travel, known as gravity assist, would cut the journey time from Earth to Neptune by nearly 20 years and save a lot of fuel in the process. After various budget cuts, the mission was reduced in scope to nominally be a Jupiter and Saturn flyby mission and would consist of two interplanetary robotic space probes, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, that would observe, analyze, and characterize various features of the Jovian and Saturnian planetary systems through the use of 10 scientific instruments. The instrument that many of us are most interested in is the Imaging Science subsystem, which consists of two television-style cameras, a wide angle and a narrow angle, that are used to take photographs of various celestial bodies that the spacecraft fly by. The photopolarimeter is a small telescope with various filters that is used to study the atmospheres of the gas giants and the surfaces of their moons, the infrared interferometer, spectrometer and radiometer is used to study heat energy, elemental composition and sunlight reflection of the planets. The ultraviolet spectrometer is used to identify atmospheric particles by analysing which wavelengths of sunlight they absorb and reflect. However, the nature of the research the voyagers were to conduct was not exclusively optical based, and thus each spacecraft was equipped with three different particle detectors that would be used to study cosmic rays and the solar wind, determine their elementary compositions and study how they interact with the outer planets. Two radio antennas fixed to the spacecraft at right angles to each other were used to study radio emissions from the gas giants. Each craft was also fitted with a magnetometer, which is used to measure planetary and solar magnetic fields and study how they interact with each other. The high gain antenna uses a 3.7 meter wide reflector dish that transmits science and engineering data back to Earth. Four, three, two, one. We have ignition and we have liftoff. August 20th, 1977. The first Voyager probe is launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida aboard a Titan III Centaur rocket. Due to the trajectories of the spacecraft, NASA were left with the peculiar situation where Voyager 1 was launched 16 days later than Voyager 2, but would get to Jupiter first. Voyager 1 made its closest approach to Jupiter on March 5th, 1979, and Voyager 2 followed four months later on July 9th. Voyager took higher quality images of Jupiter than had ever been achieved previously and gave us the most detailed views of its atmosphere. For the first time we saw the distinct swirling cloud bands in high resolution as they raced around Jupiter's surface. We also got the best images of the great red spot seen yet which is a raging violent storm that's two to three times larger than Earth. The probes also discovered a faint ring system like we're used to seeing on Saturn and three additional moons. It was assumed that most moons would resemble our own, with countless craters formed by collisions with asteroids and meteorites built up over millions of years. The first moon that a Voyager probe got a good look at was Io, and it immediately dispelled this theory, as Io's surface was lacking any of the impact craters we expected to see. This implied that there had to have been some sort of process that was constantly refreshing the surface of this moon. This mystery was promptly solved when Voyager sent back photos showing huge volcanic eruptions firing plumes of lava into the Jovian system. Multiple volcanoes and lava lakes were identified on Io by the Voyager probes, and thanks to these discoveries we now know that Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. When Voyager 2 flew by Europa, it again observed a surface lacking any craters. 
the Europa surface was almost completely smooth and flat. The deep red streaks seen in this image indicate that the surface has been fractured and filled by whatever lies beneath. All of these findings indicate that the surface of Europa is frozen water and is covering a vast ocean of water greater in volume than all of Earth's oceans combined. Since these discoveries, Europa has become the number one candidate in our solar system to potentially harbour extraterrestrial life. It was now that the aforementioned gravity assist first came into play. Both Voyager probes used Jupiter's immense gravity to slingshot themselves onto Saturn. Upon arrival at Saturn, atmospheric measurements taken by Voyager 1 determined that approximately 7% of Saturn's upper atmosphere is helium, while almost all the rest is hydrogen. One implication of this finding is that Saturn is the only planet that can float on water, if you could find a lake big enough. Saturn's complex ring system had always been assumed to be entirely a result of gravitational forces, but the Voyagers observed radial features in some of the rings that don't conform to orbital mechanics and therefore were not consistent with this assumption. Voyager also discovered a new ring in Saturn's system, as well as five new moons. Two of these moons, Prometheus and Pandora, were seen to have a significant effect on keeping the ring system well defined by acting as shepherd moons. The final primary objective of the Voyager mission was now in sight. Saturn's largest moon, Titan. We knew Titan had an atmosphere, but images sent back by Voyager showed that it was so thick that the surface of the moon was completely hidden. However, by measuring how the atmosphere interacted with sunlight, its chemical composition was determined to be 90% nitrogen. This data suggested that Titan might be the only non-Earth body in the solar system that may have liquid on its surface. At this point, with all primary mission objectives accomplished, and due to the route it had to take to ensure an optimal trajectory past Titan, Voyager 1 was sent hurtling out of the plane of the ecliptic. Voyager 2, however, thanks to a successful Titan visit by its interplanetary companion, was now given the all to take another gravity assist, this time via Saturn, and extend its mission on toward Uranus. NASA's intrepid little interplanetary explorer Voyager 2 was venturing into truly uncharted territory for the first time. No space probe before it had ever visited any celestial bodies beyond Saturn. On January 24, 1986, Voyager 2 made its closest approach to Uranus and sent back the first high-resolution images of Uranus's atmosphere ever taken, and revealed a largely featureless surface when compared to Jupiter and Saturn. Uranus is unique in that its obliquity, its axial tilt, is huge compared to all the other planets. Its rotational axis is almost parallel to the plane of its orbit. Before the Voyager 2 flyby, scientists had no evidence of a magnetosphere at Uranus, but when Voyager 2's readings clearly confirmed magnetic fields at the planet, it wasn't a huge surprise. What was a surprise, however, was that, unlike Earth, Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus's magnetic axis did not line up with its rotational axis, and was offset by 60 degrees. Not only that, but it is off-center by a third of Uranus's radius. This told scientists Uranus's magnetic field was not generated by its core, but by an electrically conducting stream of particles within its atmosphere. Voyager thus discovered that Uranus was not necessarily a gas giant like Jupiter and Saturn, but an ice giant, a new class of planet with large traces of vaporized ices like water, ammonia, and methane. Images sent back to Earth from Voyager 2's imaging science subsystem revealed 10 new moons and two new rings of Uranus. After completing various observations, Voyager 2 left Uranus using another gravity boost and made its way onto its final planetary target, Neptune. When Voyager 2 made its closest approach to Neptune on August 25th, 1989, it was now so far away from Earth that signals sent back home took over four hours to arrive, traveling at the speed of light. Unlike what was seen at Uranus, Voyager 2's flyby of Neptune revealed a dynamic, animated atmosphere with powerful cyclones manifesting as large dark spots on its upper cloud deck. The largest, about the size of Earth, was dubbed the Great Dark Spot. Winds near this storm were shown to be the strongest ever recorded in the solar system, thundering by at 1,200 miles an hour. By comparison, the fastest wind speed ever recorded on Earth is 253 miles per hour, and even this was only sustained for a few seconds. Voyager also sent back photos revealing streaks of clouds casting shadows on the atmosphere below. Voyager also gave us scientific data and high-res images of Neptune's largest moon, Triton. Triton was revealed to be one of the coldest bodies in the solar system, with a surface temperature of just 38 degrees above absolute zero. That's minus 235 degrees Celsius. One of the last but most significant discoveries made by Voyager 2 was found at Triton. Active volcanism, but not the kind we're used to on Earth, or as recently discovered on Io. These were cryovolcanoes, spewing nitrogen gas along with ice and dust particles up to 8 kilometers high. That's as high as Mount Everest. Twelve years after launch, Voyager's planetary mission was complete. It had visited all four of the giant outer planets, and in doing so taught us much about our celestial neighbors. The Voyager mission discovered multiple moons and rings, and taught us that moons aren't all chunks of rock orbiting their planets but some are fully-fledged worlds in their own right with atmospheres, oceans, and active geologies. And so it was to be that the two brave explorers, Voyager 1 and 2, were to continue on trajectories that will ultimately take them out of the solar system and into interstellar space. Indeed, in August 2012 and November 2018, Voyager 1 and 2 respectively became the first man-made objects to leave their heliosphere, the protective bubble of magnetic fields and particles created by the Sun. If you were asked to compile an abridged encyclopedia of Earth and humanity that would allow, millions of years in the future, some unknowable alien life form to understand our planet and our species, what would you include?
This was a question Carl Sagan and his team of curators had to ask themselves when it was first noted that after embarking on their grand tour of the outer planets, the voyagers would have accrued enough speed such that they'd exceed the solar system's escape velocity and would continue indefinitely into interstellar space. Each spacecraft was therefore loaded with a golden record on which was etched 116 photos and scientific drawings that would in some way encapsulate what it meant to be human at the time the voyagers left Earth. Accompanying these photos were a variety of sounds of the Earth, such as wind, rain, thunder, whale song, crickets, laughter, heartbeat, as well as various traditional and contemporary songs and greetings in 55 languages. Space is so inconceivably vast and empty that it remains unlikely that any intelligent life form will ever find this interstellar ambassador. But regardless, this message from a tiny planet orbiting an insignificant star floating through the infinite cosmic void will continue on for perhaps billions of years, potentially outliving our sun and even our species, carrying this capsule of a place and time long forgotten, preserving our dreams, our ambitions, and our legacy, and relaying the message to anyone that will listen that we were here, and we were explorers.